Rushing Wind Biker Church at 10 Peachtree Court in Holbrook, New York, the crossroads of freedom and faith. God bless you all. Jesus loves you all. How are we doing? It's a great day to be alive, isn't it? You know, it's uh, those songs we, uh, we chose earlier this week. It's kind of interesting how the week develops sometimes. And you make decisions way before. And then everything just seems to fall into place at the right time. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Let's, uh, let's come to the Lord in prayer. And, uh, and I think I have a message that's going to go along with what the theme of the evening is. Um, with the music and even the fellowship. Father, we uh, thank you for this sacred place you've given us. We thank you for this place of refuge, Lord. Lord, the world outside is, is very hard. And it uh, comes at us from all different directions. But Lord, let us not forget that you have created this safe space by the blood of your Son. Um, and Lord, when we come here, uh, it doesn't matter what we are out there, that we're your children here. We're all saved by the blood of your son, and we're family by the blood of your son. Lord, as we, we take a look at, at actually what we should be as, uh, as believers, how we uh, promote this, this faith, how we promote this atmosphere of church, Lord, that we might be a product that the world desires to have, not create a product that the, the earth desires to have, but that we are actually the product and the manifestation of your son. And so it draws people. We thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit that does a good work in each one of us. We thank you for the things that you allow us to go through to perfect us, that we might show the world a faith that perseveres and is victorious over all things. And Lord, uh, continue to teach us and allow your Holy Spirit to have his way in this place tonight. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, um, I decided when I'm preaching once a month on Wednesdays from now on, I'm going to keep in the book of Mark. I'm just going to continue on, and whoever doesn't come on Wednesdays and comes Sundays, they're going to have to get the notes or listen to it online. You know, um, We've come to a place in, um, in Jesus' ministry that um, he actually gets cornered by the Pharisees and the scribes. It's, uh, it's interesting when we, we see what's going on in the news today and uh, the, the state of the world and the atmosphere. And, um, and we see a point in time when, when Jesus is now cornered by the Pharisees, the religious legalists and lawyers and um, and we're going to go into chapter 7 it says that the Pharisees and the scribes actually encircled him and cornered him you know and, and when you think about what the Pharisees and the scribes are it's kind of ironic in this day and age because the Pharisees are religious lawyers that are trying to twist Jesus's words and, and get him to make a mistake so they can condemn him. And, and do you know what scribes are? The scribes are the paparazzi of the day. I don't know if you realize that. Because they just didn't write scriptures. They wrote what went on that day. And they wrote history. And they wrote accounts. So they're the reporters of the day. Because their job was to record history. And record scripture and everything else. So. It's funny, we, we just pick up the newspaper, always well, we hear what's going on in the world, and you have lawyers trying to twist people's words, and the people are there to write it down to get every, everything. Um, nothing's changed in 2,000 years, amen? You know? And uh, we talked Sunday about what Jesus was to the world, and that was the, uh, the message Sunday was that we need to be the authentic Jesus to the world, if you're a member. 
You know, and, and what is the authentic Jesus? It's, it's love and compassion. It's serving and mercy. And it's, uh, it's, it's going out and sacrificing and laying your life down for others. It's not preaching heavy scriptures and beating people with the Bible and condemning people. Um, because that's what religion does. And this is another conversation, really, of religion versus true faith in Jesus Christ. And, and we talked about Sunday how um, when Jesus went out and, and was Jesus, people came flocking. And, and Sunday we talked about we need to do that. We need to be what Jesus was, and people will come, just like they did then and not be the condemning Jesus and the, the condescending Jesus, but the serving and humble Jesus that had compassion and love. And it draws people because people want that, especially in a dark world that we, we live in today. And, and the thing that, that, that started this conversation in this particular story, and also something that they hated Jesus for, was the religious hierarchy of the day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and even the scribes, they were the hierarchy. And you don't flock to anybody else for God stuff but, but us. You know, I went to Bible college, or whatever it was back then. You know? And I got the robes and the hats, and I got a title. And I'm a Pharisee. I'm the one that brings God's word. And, and why are you flocking to him? And that created a lot of the jealousy. Because religion causes jealousy. I don't know if you realize that. You know, one of the, one of the drawbacks of religion is, uh, is to make people jealous that you have something they need, so they have to come to you. And that's what the Pharisees had with all these rules and laws. And they held all the sacred words, you know, and, and people had to come and, and they had to do whatever they said because uh, they wanted to make God happy. And, and the Pharisees said, well, if you want to know how to make God happy, well, we got all the information for you. Now Jesus came, and he's just a guy loving people and connecting them with God without all the robes, the information, the, the education. And, uh, and the Pharisees hated him, and they wanted to get rid of him, and they were jealous. You know, their philosophy is people should be following us not him, you know, and they stood tall and they had the posture of who we are. And Jesus was just a humble man who many times would get down with people in their life, in their stuff, and sometimes even below them to, to lift them up. And so now the, the, the Pharisees corner them, very much like you see a press conference nowadays and they have somebody on the spot and they want them to make a mistake. And everybody's going to write it down as soon as he makes that mistake. This is, this is what Jesus is dealing with right now. So I want to read Mark chapter 7, the first 14 verses, 13 verses, and see exactly how this goes. Because we know that you never want to corner Jesus, right? <laughs> you, know, you might as well just shoot yourself and just get it over with. Because you want to try to corner Jesus, he's got the advantage. <laughs> you know, it always works that way, doesn't it? And, uh, and, and also as we grow in Christ, we can have that posture when people think they can catch us if we're wise in the way of, of God and Jesus, that we'll have answers that flip every situation. Because Jesus is, is the winner of every argument. Amen. You know? And so chapter 7 says, The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had, they had come to Jerusalem. So they, they cornered him and they circled him. They didn't want him to get away. They wanted to really attack him and and try to get him to say the wrong thing. And they had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands. That is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they came to the marketplace, they don't eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there were many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not wash according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with unpure hands? 
And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. You know, it's, it's, it's really great when Jesus, they come at him with something, and, and he says, Isaiah warned us about you. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah, and they can't argue with the scriptures. You know, so Jesus is saying, our, our sacred scriptures warned us that you would be coming. You know, and, and the God stuff is calling you out right now. I love when that happens. Because all the pressure's off us. You know, sometimes we want to be the one to bring the words of enlightenment that someone's off. But it's so much better when God's word is doing it and we're off the hook. It's like, <laughs> it's God said it. You know, I'm just kind of the messenger, you know. And so he says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the principles or the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the traditions of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say... If a man says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, which is to say it was given to God, um, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many such things. And so... Um, Jesus is, is talking about, at this point, the Jewish faith has become a conglomeration of laws and traditions that have become laws. You know, the Bible itself, the Old Testament, the, uh, the Torah, has 613 laws. Right? And we know some of them are the, the kosher laws and you know, ceremonial things and stuff like that. Um, but it's funny, and I'll mention this in a second, there's only one that had to do with preparing food and eating food. Now, the kosher laws was what kind of food you could eat. You know, you couldn't eat things with blood in it, and there was things that were basically health codes. But none of the stuff that the, uh, the Pharisees are talking about are even in the scriptures. You see, the problem is they didn't just go by the scriptures. So over the decades, they had two other areas that they were getting these laws and traditions. Uh, one was called the Tal Talmudic laws from the Talmud. Right? These are rabbinical writings. And, and the Talmud, the, the main book of Talmud, was 6,200 pages. And it had thousands of additional laws. So they were added as traditions, but they made them, um, made the people adhere to them as if they were laws that were right out of the scriptures. And on top of that, you had rabbinical books, and you had many, many books that rabbis would uh, would write. And so, uh, you know, I liken them to Bible commentaries when, when they try to tell you, you know, this is what the Bible means. And so you're supposed to do this because the Bible does that. Or there are uh, people who have gotten um, different methodologies on this is how you're supposed to pray. And it doesn't say in the Bible, but they kind of take a scripture here, take a scripture there, and they put some words together, and this is this is what the Bible says about prayer and, and all of a sudden they give you stuff to do and and you know just kind of a, a side statement you know when you have a, a prayer that you believe you have to say the same way to wrestle things from God I hope you realize that's witchcraft that's not Christianity because you believe the words and doing it right forces God to act and that's witchcraft and spirituality it's nothing to do with Christianity because you can't force God to do anything. You know, you can't say, well, A plus B plus C equals blessing. But there are many, there are many philosophies and, and things that say if you do that, God must react. And um, it is so far from the truth. And, and where this came from with the Jews is there was what was called rabbinical Judaism, which was a lot of Judaism. And what, what they did is they considered Moses the ultimate rabbi 
who started a lineage of other rabbis that in their status could create more laws and add to the sacred scriptures. Very much like the Pope does in Catholicism, where the Pope is, is kind of the embodiment of Peter, who Peter never made scripture, Peter never even made laws, and he dare never change the word of God. You know, but that's a tradition that was handed down in, in, in Catholicism, that he was the first pope, so now the pope were, in, in, in a sense, apostles from the lineage of, of, um, of Peter, and so they had the right to add or subtract to the Bible. God help us if anybody starts doing that, because God has warnings for that. But this is what the rabbinical people thought about the, uh, the rabbis, because the rabbis taught that you know, we have special revelation because we were a rabbi like Moses was a rabbi, and Moses made the law. So they had written laws, and then they had oral laws. And so the oral laws became so many because they wanted to uh, um, really control people and get them to, to do everything they wanted them to do. And all this other stuff is what is called in the Bible traditions of man. They have nothing to do with scripture or the word of God or the laws and the, the commandments of God. And we still do the same thing today, don't we? From church to church. You have how you should dress when you come to church, how you should sit when you come to church. Some, some churches have, the, the services have got to be a certain way. You know, and there's some like at 1035, you know exactly what's happening. And it's because they believe that the structure and the way they do things is the way that it's supposed to happen. And if you don't do it that way, then you're not really honoring God because God wants you to do things this way. And, you know, what kind of songs do we sing? Do we stand up? Do we sit down? And, and there are traditions of men that, that churches do make almost laws. Like if you're in a Pentecostal church, and you don't stand while you worship, well, you can't really be worshiping because you, you stand. That's what you do because holy people stand. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? We, we've seen churches like that. You know, and, and I pray nothing like that ever happens here because we have people from all different denominations, people of all different Christian distinctives, and, and they're all valid, and they're all important, and they all speak to each individual. So we have some people that sit, some people that stand. You know, once in a while, somebody likes to dance. All right? But it's all good. Because we're not going to make traditions of men into uh, laws, and into uh, a, really an act of condemnation if you don't do this. You're not as holy as me. You're not as righteous as me. You know, and you're not as close to God as me. And, and, and we do this in church, don't we? Don't churches, you get that you know, impression. And we fight against that. But a lot of places, that's the way it is. You know, a lot of places you walk in, and they're a good church, but people look the same. And, and they all kind of practice everything the same. You know, and, and the thing is, in the big picture, that's not what the church was supposed to be. Because the beauty of the church was the diversity of everyone coming together, being so different yet being able to worship and love each other as one family. You know, it's why we try to come alongside other churches that are different than ours. You know, maybe those people won't feel comfortable here, but we can worship together and we can do outreaches together so we can show the world that the traditions that keep us separate in identity have nothing to do with our theology and have nothing to do with who's closer to God and who's not closer to God, it's just personal preference. It's like how we come dressed to church. Some people have leather and, and some people have flannel. Some people have dresses and some people don't have dresses. You know, but it's all good because it's all personal conviction because there's nothing in the Bible that dictates that. But it's traditions of men to make people comfortable and kind of to make them conform. And so this is a story of the Pharisees they're explaining about this thing about washing their hands um, because it was one of the rabbinical laws. You don't eat unless you wash your hands. This is not about health codes right? because that's not what he, they said. You know, they weren't washing their hands because they were germs. They were washing their hands, and I believe in, in the one verse it actually says, um, where is it? Da -da. 
And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe. All right, now understand what they're saying when they say they've received in order to observe, okay? Because when you're in Judaism, they have laws and traditions and, and commandments. If you practice it, you receive it, all right? And if you receive it, you do it to observe what is right in God's eyes. And so they're taking these things that are not in the scriptures, and who gave it to them? The rabbis did. Not God and not the word. But the rabbis and the Pharisees are saying, you've been given these things so you may observe. And they're saying, you've been given these things by us so you can observe. And so you can be right with God. You know, an observance, we know kind of in the religious, you know, when you observe a holiday, you observe something, you're actually doing something that God likes or God mandates or however you want to view it. And so they're saying, you know, these things have been given to you so you can honor God. But they weren't given to them by God. It was given to them by the rabbis and by the Pharisees because they wanted to add things. So they had control because it's always been about control. And um, there were things to try to get the people to feel that God was good with them. And that's a dangerous thing when man dictates what we should do so that God is good with us. Right? Because they're creating religion. They're creating all the things we've seen in churches that is repetitious. And that's what Jesus is kind of coming against. Is these are repetitious things that if I do this, God is good with me, even if my heart's not in the right place. As long as I do the stuff, God's required to be good with me because I've done the religion the way the religion is supposed to be done. And Jesus even says, your heart is so far from God. Yeah. And so, um, again, now I want to say the one verse in Scripture that talks about eating. There's only one. It's in Deuteronomy. And it says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. It's grace. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. You know, you're thanking God for the blessings of the land and the fact that you have food to eat. It's the only thing that's said in the entire Bible about uh, eating, you know, you know, washing your hands, you know, this other stuff. You know, when you're eating, you thank God. You, know, you bless God and thank God for the blessings of you eating. And so, again, um, there's a lot of traditions that we hold on to. And, and I want us to kind of look at ourselves through the, the, the mindset of what Jesus is trying to talk to the Jews. Because the Jews were experts in creating laws and traditions. And so there was a million things. I mean, there's a couple, I'm trying to remember the one. Um, you weren't allowed to eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath. You know, that's in the rabbinical law, the traditions. Because the chicken worked on the Sabbath. And so it was breaking the law, the Sabbath. You know, and you see if you go to the city and you go to certain hotels, like my son was living in a, in a high rise that was a, a co-op or apartments that was all Jewish except for them. And so they got two elevators. Uh, anybody know what I'm talking about with the elevators? Okay, when you're in a building that is, is catered to people who are Jewish, on the Sabbath you're not allowed to do work. And so you get in that elevator and it automatically stops on every single floor because you're not allowed to, to do that, according to the law, because that's work. Because you've caused something to make the elevator to stop, that's considered work. And I guess kind of in a broad sense it is. And so they'll have an elevator. I forgot what they call the one elevator. Well, the, the other elevator is kind of the, the Gentile elevator. The kosher elevator. Well, no, that's not the Gentile <laughs> elevator. But, but just to give you an idea of where they went with the laws, right? because they didn't believe that, that people could honor God of their own free will. They had to be told how to honor God, how to be told to act righteous. You need to do all these things. We can't allow you to kind of like allow yourself to, to actually understand and love God enough to make these decisions on your own. And so they ended up with all these, these lists. And so um, they interpreted traditions as if it was a proof of your obedience to God. I'm going to say it again because it's important. 
the rabbis interpreted all the traditions as if it was proof that you were obedient to God. When we know that God is all about our heart, not about what we, we wear, not about, oh, I made a mistake and I pressed the button on Saturday. You know, because you can, you can do that and have a great heart for God and have a great relationship. And all of a sudden, you're put in a place of guilt because you did something that God never said not to do, but they've convinced you that you shouldn't be doing it. And, and a lot of that does happen in Christianity. And sometimes we can do it to ourselves. You know, as good as we are as a family, sometimes I think we try to um, impress our, our viewpoint on things that aren't scriptural, even on, on people that we care about here. And, and that's not really what love does. You know, love shows grace. And like I said, they, 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 didn't, they didn't believe that people could possibly love God enough to make these decisions on their own. And so they had to make sure nobody made a mistake. Two, two instances, just personally, church, all right? Um, about these things about traditions. And, you know, you know the church is, is, an, is an important thing, right? All right, but we know we're the church. When, when we were moving into our first new building, I had a, a guy with me, he was my first assistant pastor, great carpenter, great carpenter. you know, and, and, uh, and we're building a place for people who aren't perfect. And so I didn't want to go crazy, like, you know, when I built stuff when I was a contractor, everything's got to be perfect, not people paying for it. But we kind of, like, this was going to be a picture of what we were. So, so we're doing this work, and it was very challenging because he was like Mr. Perfect everything, right? And so um, he's putting molding on the door. I don't have molding, but there's molding somewhere. <laughs> so we had a door, and he's putting molding on. And, uh, and first of all, he doesn't do it the way you're supposed to do it. He does his two sides, and then the top one. And that's not the way you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to do the top one, because you can adjust the angles as you do the sides. So he's got the two sides on, and he cuts the top one. And he had to go to the back for the saw every time he cut. So he didn't fit, went in the back. And uh, it didn't fit, went in the back. Now he cut it too short. I can't use this one. He's got to do something else. And so he went through like three pieces of wood. And I said, you know, it's, it's, you know, I mean, look at the rest of the place. This doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. And this was the reaction. It's only God's house we're building. Oh, really? <laughs> and there was so much about the building has to be perfect. And he, he missed the broad point that the building was just to keep us dry when it rained and warm in, in the winter and air conditioning in the summer. And the people are the ones God's perfected. And so all that stuff, if we start concentrating on that, because that, you know, you take it off the deep end and now you have the marble and the gold and the steps and all the stuff that traditional religion has said, this is God's house, so it needs to be all this. Meanwhile, the people are, are going through motions because they think the building is sacred. And there isn't a building that's sacred. The spirit in the people and the body of Christ is what's sacred. The building is just a building, you know. And so the, Jesus is trying to get them to understand that your traditions can be a source of pride. This is where it messes up Christianity. Because you get people who, who you, you need to do church this way. And we all do church this way. And if you don't do church that way, you're not as holy as us. You know? It could be how we dress. It could be how we do communion. It could be how we do the offering. Because I had this discussion with a guy in our first building. You know, first of all, helmets for offering, it's like a sacrilege, you know? Then, then he said, we need to have a class on how to do the offering because you need to do this a certain way. And as I was putting this message to you, I'm thinking, we got helmets to take the offering. One of them saved a life. We have this thing in our armor called the helmet of salvation. I think helmets are pretty representative. <laughs> of us accepting the gratitude and the gifts of people for our salvation mm -hmm. because he saved us. Those helmets, one of them saved my life, you know? And so I didn't do it because of that, but when you think about it, it makes more sense than, you know, a $500 gold thing with some felt in it, you know? 
because the helmets are more representative. You know, it's like we, we do communion because it represents something. So it's nice that we have something that, and I just thought of this, it's not that I had this great epiphany when I started the church. Ooh, helmet of salvation. Let's see, helmet. No, no. That just popped up today as I'm putting this message together. You know, and, and what happens is we create our own brands of holiness. People create their own brands of holiness. And they, they, they try to get other people to live up to their brand of holiness. And then you have people conforming, except for the one or two or a couple that feel that's what it's supposed to be. So they're comfortable and no one else is comfortable. Because now they're conforming to what somebody else, and it's not about sin issues. It's not about you know coming to church in bikinis and, 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 and stuff. But it's about you know coming in leather and denim and you know, and sometimes there's people that, that come here and they don't live in a place where they can take a shower. And we've had people come in here and, and you kind of knew that. You know, but there are churches I've seen them ask people to either sit in the back or come back when they're, you know, and these are traditions that hurts the church. You know, differences are things that we're supposed to celebrate. Amen? Amen. You know, even how we practice, the people that like to sit. And I think it's a beautiful thing that we have pastors that like to stand and raise our hands, and we have pastors that would rather sit and be maybe more reverent and worship in their own way. And this way, anybody that comes in that door is comfortable with whatever they, they feel comfortable with. You know? Because we're not going to bring traditions in here, other than we will ride. Because <laughs> you know, if you don't have we will ride in the service, not a good church. you don't have a holy church. <laughs> you know? But you understand what I'm saying. You know? And holiness is not found in traditions. It's not found in methodology. Um, what Jesus is talking about here is really wrapped up in the two great commandments. right? All the laws of the prophets, I think Jesus even said that. All the law and the prophets are summed up into two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. Love your brother as yourself. Period. You know? And so what, what this is supposed to be is a combination of those things. Is we all love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and spirit. And by being Jesus to each other, we love each other as Jesus. As uh, as Jesus loved us and how God loves us. And uh, outwardness can be faked, right? Holiness on the outward can be faked. I can look as holy as anybody could were. That thing that that church feels makes me righteous and holy looking. Or how I talk. Amen, brother, praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I say something that, you know, it's kind of a little sketchy from the pulpit. You know, I say, oh, I think doing that. But it makes a point because these people understand it in certain ways. You know? and, um, and I want to just talk for a minute before I close on what true holiness is. Because that's what Jesus is talking about. All your righteous ways, as Paul says, are garbage, rubbish, or scubula. scubula. <laughs> If you don't know what that means, we'll talk afterwards. I love Paul because every once in a while he says something that you don't say in church. So um, Jesus is trying to tell them it's all a matter of the heart. Because anything that's on the outside can produce a sense of pride. You know, I'm better than you, I'm holier than you because I do this. But what true holiness is, is all on the inside. And when you, when you see the list that Paul talks about, and Jesus actually talks about the same things, it's about humility. All these things are aspects of us being humble. Um, Paul actually, in, in the third chapter of Ephesians, talks about holiness as extending grace to other people when you've been given grace. That's what holiness is. God has given us grace. We sang about grace. You know, and when, when we're holy, we're extending grace in the way that Jesus extended grace to us. That's everything in a nutshell. You know, Paul talks about it in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and he explains what true holiness is. And it's all character. It's not dress or how we do church or anything else. And, and starting in, in verse 20 of chapter four of Ephesians. He says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. He's talking about 
Um, the, the bad things, not the good things. Um, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reverence to your former matter of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on your new self, which is the likeness of God, and has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. And then he explains what holiness really is. Therefore, laying aside all false, falsehood, speak truth to each other. <clears throat> speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are all members one of another. Stop lying. Only speak the truth. That's what holiness is. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And don't give the devil an opportunity. Because when you're anger, angry and you hold on to it, it gives you an opportunity to sin. Because anger leads to something. Right? And when it leads to something, you're allowing Satan a foothold to do something. To either you sin or cause someone else to sin. Either way, you sin. Because when you cause someone to sin, you sin also. He who steals must steal no more, but rather must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who is in need. We were created to work and produce things for the kingdom of God. Tangible things. You know? And so... People who don't work where they legitimately can work and can legitimately produce so that those who legitimately can't work might have something are unholy. They're unrighteous. And that, in essence, is sin. Right? They become dependent when there's no really reason why they should become dependent. God didn't create anyone to be dependent unless they have disabilities and things that the world has put on them where there's a legitimacy. Because then that legitimacy of dependency actually creates a, a, um, a situation of grace where Jesus can speak into that life by being poured into by other people with love and, and provision and other things. Because that's one of the purposes of the enemy corrupting this world. You know, one of the, the big blessings of my sister who's been disabled since she was four it's going on 42 years now, only 42 years in, in April. Um, Jesus has been seen on how people take care of my sister, on the interaction. And, and, and so my, my sister has been used in a powerful way so people can see the, the compassion and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Because when, when, when children particularly have things, it brings out compassion. It brings out all those qualities of Jesus. And, and Jesus is seen in a powerful way, you know? But if you're just someone who can legitimately work and say, you know, I'm just gonna have people take care of me, it's a sin and it's unholy. Because work, producing, being generous with every part of your life, not just your money for God's work, is holy. Because God doesn't provide for you just for you. God provides for you so you can provide for others. And the more you provide for others, the more God will pour into you. And then it just gets bigger and it gets bigger. And you see holiness in action and the character of Christ in action. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good and edifying according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Edify people. We've been going over encouragement in, in the peer mentoring class. That's what this is talking about. Encouragement is grace. You know, Jesus has all these things to encourage us about life. And he pours into us so we can encourage others. And that's holiness. Because that's the character of Christ. We're not going to talk down to people. We're going to, you know, people, you know, it's bad. Things are going, you know, complain about everything. You know, and putting people down. 
because that's not that's just not it's not just not holy that is sinful and is evil you know and these are all the things that God cares about you know not if I'm wearing you know the same shirt to church for the last three weeks you know not that I did that but I wouldn't be sitting if I did you know do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed on the day of redemption when God leads you to something, when Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit leads you to do something, speak something into your life, you do it. You know? Because when God speaks into you through the Holy Spirit, it is virtually always for someone else's good. It might be for good for you too, right? but that's a byproduct if you get good out of good that you're doing with someone else. So when you grieve the Holy Spirit and you say, no, I'm not going to do that, I don't want to do that, I don't make that decision. You're affecting how God wants to interact with other people because the Holy Spirit works through us to touch other people, you know, not for ourselves. So never not listen to the Holy Spirit. You know? Now we want to run things past mature Christians, you know, because sometimes things come in and I don't know if that's from God. And, and you know, we're two or three gathered together, the Holy Spirit's there and we can sort it out with scripture. And considering all things in your life and your calling and your mission and everything else, you know, if you're not sure, we can we can kind of nail that thing down. Um, but but even if it's something you don't like and we nail it down, you, you should do it. <laughs> yeah. Because you have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't, eventually the Holy Spirit will talk, stop talking to you. That's not a place you want to be. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't trust you to do the things that God wants done. The Holy Spirit will tell somebody else to do it and you'll be taken right out of mission. Um, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Um, the first ones, you pretty much, you know, you know that. You know, we're not going to be evil. We're not going to slander people. We're not going to gossip. Malice is an interesting thing because, you know, you don't really know what malice is. Malice is when you intentionally want to do evil to somebody. You know, all this stuff, all the other stuff, can be like we do evil, we do something, you know, we, we slander. But when you have a, 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 a premeditation that I want to do that to that person because I hate them and it will hurt them, that's what malice is. That's adding another depth of what evil is. You know, and you know, that can be like revenge. You know, and we know vengeance is the Lord's. Um, and, and, you know, revenge is also praying for the Lord to get you revenge. That's still you having revenge. All right? You leave things in God's hands. You say, Lord, you just do what, what you feel is your will in that situation. You know, because a lot of times we read even in Psalms that David is saying, you know, snuffeth out the enemy. <laughs> They're bad guys. Just get rid of them. Yeah? And, and, and God doesn't do that. God's just listening. See, the thing about God is God is pretty cool because he allows us to vent to him. He's not going to do what we ask him to do. You know, he's going to do what his will is. But David would just, you know, Lord, just get rid of them. You know, and just by doing that, David felt, ah, I'm relieved. You know, but God really never, you know, did exactly what David wanted. But David got to get it off his chest. And, and that's a good thing because sometimes we just need to get it off our chest so we don't take matters into our own hands. Right? Yes. Amen. And as we wind down, uh, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also forgave you. This is what holiness is. This is what we do. This is what this is about. It's not about how we praise. It's not about how we dress. It's not about religious stuff. We do that. That's holy. You know? Because we have this connotation that religious things make us holy and it doesn't because that's all outside stuff and you know I don't know about you but I faked that for a lot of years you know I came and I knelt and I closed my eyes and was thinking about the ball game thought I was praying <laughs> I know you're laughing but I know some of you are out there <laughs> it might not be a ball game but whatever you got going on you know and so that doesn't honor God at all and it's not that those things are bad Understand that the things that they're saying are not bad. Should you wash your hands before you eat? 
probably a wise idea. <laughs> Don't make it a religious obligation. Right. You know? And, and some people, they like, and this is something, and, and Jerry knows, it's one of the worst moments I've had in this church. If somebody came in and they had a suit and tie on. And me and my well-thinking liberty, you don't have to wear a suit and tie here. Never been back. Still breaks my heart. You know? uh, I'm not proud of that. You know? But I had my own like freedom. Everybody should be free to be casual was, was holy. So I had my own brand of holy. You know, that I saw a church of people with, you know, just denim and, and t-shirts and leather. And that was holy. No, it's not holy either. That's my brand of holy. That's not God's brand of holy. And, uh, you know, that's something I do bring up from time to time because, you know, I, I, I'm not proud of it, but I want everyone to know I'm susceptible. And maybe well-intentioned in my own weird, weird way. And sometimes we have to just look at ourselves and, uh, and understand that uh, God's holiness is so much different than our holiness. You know? And I want to end with, uh, Jesus makes a strong, strong statement in verses 14 to 20. We're going to end here. After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying, listen to me, all of you. And I imagine he was almost yelling at this point. He wanted to make a point. You know, listen. Listen closely. There's nothing outside of a man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things that proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. When he has left the crowd, he entered the house and his disciples questioned him about the parable. These guys must have been dense because I don't know if that was pretty clear to me what he was just saying. You know? And he said... Are you so lacking in understanding also? You're so dense. <laughs> Don't you understand that whatever goes into a man from the outside can't defile him because it does not go into his heart? It doesn't go into his heart. You know? But into his stomach. And it's eliminated. You know? So anything that comes from the outside, we can't worry about what it's going to be doing to people. But out of the heart comes truth. You know? And if we can have our heart be in the place like Jesus was, and we walk in that holiness, it doesn't matter how we praise. Because we're praising in truth and in spirit. It doesn't matter what we do when we come in here, how we dress, because we're dressing in truth and in spirit. Because Jesus said the day is coming when the Father wishes for worshipers that worship in truth and in spirit, not with outward things, not with religion, not like the Pharisees and the high religion and all the stuff, you know? something that I think has always been uh, an underlying and sometimes broad philosophy here is we want people to come and we don't want to judge them no matter what they are. You know, we want them to practice their Christianity. You know, there's truth and obviously there's heresy. Um, and, you know, heresy, you have to deal with heresy, but heresy isn't as widespread as you might think. There's a lot of denominational things that come in here and we don't have to agree on absolutely everything. Somebody wants to come in here in a three-piece suit, you know, I'm waiting for the big hat ladies. Anybody ever go to one of those churches? I, I, want, I want some big hat ladies, you know, that tambourines and stuff, you know, and, and, and I hope they're going to feel just as home as, as us and, you know, this and, and the people that sit because we're one body. And that's what Jesus is saying. You know, you, you've cordoned off so many people and you've made it so hard when it's all about freedom, you know. He came to set us free so we might have freedom. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for, Lord, freedom of the Spirit, but we also thank you that you've given us the Spirit, that we can discern what is right and wrong and what is holy and what is not holy. And Lord, we do, yes, have to look at ourselves and, and do we have compassion and love and, 
and serve, and, and that's our check on what is, uh, what is right and if we're honoring you. Because as we, we saw in the last chapter, those are the things that draw all people to our Savior. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, your people here are growing in the understanding of uh, the freedom and the power, which is a dangerous combination, but a combination that can change the world if we harness it right. Lord, we thank you for your son, who shed blood that we might have grace that we can freely give. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
So who is interested in getting uh, involved in the soup rotation? Nikki. Nora. I already got you. No, I'm just, I want to start writing things down. Anybody else? No? Okay. All right. Yeah, because ideally we'd like eight all together. This way it's once a month for each person, which isn't, uh, you know, that oppressive. So anyway. Uh, Father, we, we thank you for uh, the home you've given us here, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, just let us never take for granted the fact that we can gather in your name and, and share your word and open up the scriptures and freedom that we have. Um, Lord, let us take every advantage of that while we still have that right. Lord, bless your people as they go out into their lives today uh, with opportunities to see your Holy Spirit work through them extending grace into the world around them at home and on the job and, and the people they run into. Um, well, that they feel the, the, the power of grace not being poured into them, but being poured through them. That they might see the joy on people's faces as they're used. And Lord, uh, we thank you for our, our big brother, the one who, uh, who took the, uh, the punishment we rightly deserve that we might stand here in holiness, in righteousness, being able to uh, call ourselves a child of God. We thank you for all those things. In his name we pray. All God's Amen. people said. Amen. Amen.